Hey, everybody, welcome to the Movement is Medicine podcast, episode number five. I'm your host, Kevin Carr. And in this episode, Brendan and I talked all about in-season training. So the idea that our competitive athletes should continue to train and physically develop themselves in the weight room throughout their competitive season, not just during their off season. Specifically, we spoke a lot about how to talk to athletes, coaches, and parents who might have misconceptions or fears that in-season training might cause soreness or take away from their athlete's ability to compete throughout the season. And in fact, how in-season training is the key to keeping our athletes healthy and high performing all year round and why in-season training now more than ever is more important um, than it's ever been with the current competitive climate where athletes are competing in their sport all year round. I think this was a great episode. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everybody, it's Kevin Carr here, your host of the Movement is Medicine podcast for episode number five with my wonderful and amazing co-host, Brendan Rierick, back again here on a Monday night we're recording, rather than our traditional Saturday or Sunday, so uh, we were both teaching over the weekend, CFSC events, so we couldn't really uh, align the schedules, but alas, we are still together here, and yes. instead of drinking coffee, uh, we have beer and, and wine, wine. So. Maybe that'll make for a better episode. Who knows? Um, so, Brendan, how are you? I'll sure, have a, I'll sure have a lot to say if I have finished this glass of wine or a second. Yeah. I'm well. I'm well. We had a big weekend in Chicago. Got home late last night and was up early this morning. Had. It's funny that you know, being a trainer, your busiest days are holidays, weekends, when everybody else has the day off. So I had six clients today. So it was a good day. And, uh, train smarter and harder. Wow, good for you. We were pretty quiet today because, yeah, it's school vacation week in uh, Massachusetts. And so naturally, uh, we had to have no kids. We close uh, the kids' groups for the entire week because the attendance oh. is usually pretty poor. It gives an opportunity for our coaches to have a little bit of time off. Like I was done early this afternoon, which was nice. And uh, the adult groups were about 50% attendance. My diehards were still here, but it'll be a quiet week for us uh, as well. But uh, Kind of nice to have a little bit of breather every now and then. Yeah, see, the spring break here is going to be beginning of April. So no break, no breaks here. It's a weird schedule. Yeah, you have here. different it's vacations non-traditional. Well, because they start school here on August 11th on the West Coast, That's or insane. at least in California. When I mean, I never started school before Labor Day ever <laughs> in my whole life. No. So. It's new for me out here. Different, different schedules, different uh, spring breaks, winter breaks. So well, we, uh, uh, we start with the question that I received. Yes, yeah. As, as usual, uh, we are going to fuel this week's episode with, uh, with questions. So Brendan, I know, had a question that we get pretty frequently. Um, and it's a topic we talk about pretty frequently. So if you want to expand on that, we can just let it rip from there. All right. The question was about in-season training. So there's a couple things to unpack here. One question was about the programming for in-season training and then was how to educate or market to parents as well as the athlete that in-season training is okay and that it's not going to affect or be a detriment to your playing ability or your performance on the field. So there was kind of two things. How do you program it? What do you program? What do you not? And then how do you uh, educate the parent or the athlete that it is important to maybe train uh, during the season or six to nine months a year, as opposed to just the three month window that you might have an off season. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, in-season training, like you think even back to when you and I were in high school, that's not that long ago. And more in, like more athletes were three season or three sport athletes, right? Or multi-sport athletes and that they had true downtime from their sport. So they would be training for their other sport or they might be training in the weight room or running or doing whatever you did in an off season, but now more and more athletes that I've seemingly with a majority of the ones that are competitive and especially in more competitive school districts where sports are 
uh, highly, highly valued. Um, you don't really see athletes that have true off seasons because they're constantly playing the same sport, right? So if they're playing basketball, they play for their town team, they play for a travel team, they play for an AAU team, and they have tournaments and um, and work and uh, they go to showcases. And so they're always playing. And what I said is like before is like we used to really value off season and in season, but it's almost all in season training now. If you look at it, there's just mm -hmm. you just value different teams or seasons a little bit more or less. So it's almost like in season training has to be a part of what you do, or or you're never going to actually train. <laughs> yeah, the football used to be, and kind of still is, the only sport American football the only sport that has a true off season because they only play it in the fall. But I will say that now seven on seven is a huge moneymaker and a big part of a lot of these kids uh, plan after football is to go do seven on seven tournaments. And those tournaments are taking them everywhere. And the biggest problem I'm having right now at, the high school that I work at is that those kids spend more time traveling for seven on seven tournaments than they do actually training in the off season. And I, I like seven, seven on seven, you're getting, it's, it's all skill players. So you don't really have any mm -hmm. linemen doing it. So we, we mostly majority have linemen lifting, which is great, but, uh, all they're really doing is getting a lot of routes. They are catching passes and stuff, but like that's stuff that you do with your friends on the side. Like we were doing now, that in the off season. Yeah, anyways, we were doing that right? in the off season anyways. So now it's been uh, gamified and monified, <laughs> if that's even yeah. a word. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, people are making money off of it now, and it's detracting from valuable time that we could be lifting weights or even doing another sport. I would rather the athlete run track or uh, play baseball, play basketball, or play, play another sport. I don't want more route running, more football. Uh, it, it probably benefits the quarterbacks the most uh, to, to do seven on seven. But even then I'd still rather them play baseball and, and stuff like that. So um yeah, it's it's now almost all in season training, even with American football. Yeah, it's funny. Like football was I was saying this to an athlete the other day. Like was the only sport because you couldn't physically play it all year. But they found the way around that by taking away yeah. the physicality and just including <laughs> skill players. Yeah, and seven on seven, and like to an extent, it's good at this at, to practice the skills. But if you're constantly playing and practicing, and again also valuing it over the physical development and strength training and, and physical preparation, then it continues to take away from it. Like I, I train a, a college baseball player. I train them all through high school. And I remember starting to see it creep in with them where, you know, okay, he plays on a travel team, an AAU team. And I, they'd be like, well, he really needs to pitch. He's a pitcher. And like, well, he's going to have to pitch a few innings this week. He's going to have to pitch a few innings this week. So I don't want to tire him out. And I remember eventually pulling the father aside and just saying like, if you're always telling me that we can't train hard or can't train legs, you have to tell me what you value more. Because one, I'm not going to make him so sore and so tired that he can't go out and pitch two innings. Um, but you're going to limit his ability to develop. And I said, do you really value his last couple high school seasons where he can get recruited and is playing at a high level against good competition? Or do you value these summer league games that are really just for him to practice? It's okay if he's sub maximal as far as like he might be a little tired and yeah. probably not even if we just train correctly um so that he can get to where he needs to go ultimately so it's the, the short-term gratification where they're always focused on pleasing the next coach or the next scout uh or having a good outing where they don't think about where that athlete wants to be two three four five years down the road um because they're always worried that they're going to be tired from lifting. And I, I think like, and I know you'll probably say this when you, we actually get into answering the question next, um, is like when the parents or kids are like, am I going to be tired? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you could be really tired or sore if you had a bad strength coach. Yeah. Uh, but, but if we go about this the right way, we can make sure we put the stress at the right times in the right places and not do it on the times when we don't do it. And then we can make sure that you have the best of both worlds. Right. Right. Uh 
I can't remember where I read it recently, but if you're, you never have to get ready if you already, if you're always ready, right? So why not train at some degree, at some intensity, at some level all year round? So I remember telling the football kids this past season, so our head coach for football, it was about, he loved the idea of in-season training and we train four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then games on Friday. So like you said, uh, we would just play with the intensity each day. But I told the guys, I said, if you guys have been, you guys have been training since uh, June 6th and our first game is August 26th. If we just continue training, you're not going to get crazy sore. Like you're, you're already, mm -hmm. you've adapted to it you're you're ready for this and that i was like you get crazy sore when you take six weeks off and then you come yes. back the first day but if you're always training and you're always prepared then there's nothing to get ready for so they were like oh yeah that makes sense like yeah i'm not sore i'm not i i feel good because we've been doing this for six months or for it was probably four months straight and we trained through all 11 weeks of the season, four days a week. And I would scale it based off of what I was seeing and what the athletes were telling me. But mm -hmm. yeah, we trained the entire year and we never had those in season issues that people might fear because we never stopped. It's when you stop and you take six weeks off and then you come back again. That's, that's when you're going to be sore and tired and that, that would affect your performance. But if you're always, always doing it and like you said we're almost always in season kind of um mm -hmm. you're you're not gonna get super sore it's not gonna jeopardize your performance on the field that's actually the irony of it right because the parents the coaches and the players are always worried about being sore but if they just consistently get like two lifts in a week and you're not doing anything like if you're not throwing in a bunch of random new exercises or having huge changes in the volume or intensity like a good coach wouldn't do uh, they're not really going to be sore. And I remember saying that to the, the parent and being like, every time you tell me, hey, the kid shouldn't, I don't want him training his legs this week because he's got a pitch, you're ensuring that he's going to be more sore and weaker the next time he has to do it. Right. Um, and, but it's, again, they don't understand it, that adaptation that happens. And so getting them to get that uh, makes sense. And I remember Mike talking about, uh, he had a really good conversation about in-season training at the staff meeting uh, earlier this year. And he talked about the number one thing him and Jack Parker thought about at BU was like, we're always going to get two lifts in a week. Um, because if we miss one lift, if, if we miss a lift, then we don't, then we have a whole week off. Right. Yeah. And so if you have a whole week off, the chances are you're going to be a little bit sore, a little bit stiff, a little bit, uh, out of it as, as higher. So he said, even if that meant that the lift was 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, we we're going to make sure we did something twice a week. And that kids were never sore. And then by the time that they got to, they were always a, a final uh, Frozen Four team uh, with the men's hockey team. He said, by the time we got to the Frozen Four, we were in shape. And there were a lot of teams that weren't in shape because we just had yeah. higher consistency over the course of the season without even really thinking about like, do we really need to push volume or push the intensity? We were just making sure we got one heavy set in or two heavy sets in and, and kept it moving. During the season, you are going to atrophy. Like there, there's no way to not. So I mean, I keep using American football as the example. At yeah. the beginning of the season, you've been training the off season. You might be 220 pounds and you feel pretty strong. Like, by the end of the season, you're probably going to be around 210 and yeah. you're probably, you're going to be weaker. Like you gave up your strength and power and muscle tissue to be in better shape to play the game and to practice, right? That's part of it. But the goal is to atrophy the least amount possible compared to your competitor. So if you have your competitor who trained all off season, and then they do they stop training right when practice begins by the end of the season they'll have lost a lot more muscle and strength than if you had kept those 2 to 3 workouts a week and again 
as you mentioned, so that was my response uh, in the email of this question that I received about in-season training was like, I would sell at your gym in-season training two or three days a week for 30 to 45 minutes. All you do is you come mm -hmm. in and foam roll and stretch. So you get a little soft tissue work and then you lift heavy things and go home. There's no crazy long warm ups. There's no conditioning, the conditioning and all the warm up stuff and all the movement prep stuff that's taken care of by the sport itself. So we mm -hmm. want to maintain as much muscle mass and strength as possible in season. So that was my suggestion was, yeah, sell 30 minute blocks twice a week and foam roll stretch for five to eight minutes. And then let's uh, squat bench and do some single leg stuff and some core stuff uh, and get you out of here. And let's yeah. three sets and let's go light, medium, heavy, light, me light on the first set, medium on the second set, heavy on the third set, boom, next exercise. Let's get you out of here. Just maintain yeah. what we've, what we've, so it's, it's almost this, uh, you took three steps forward in the off season and in the in season, we're just going to take one step back in the weight room as opposed to taking three steps forward, three steps back, three steps forward, three steps back. I only want to take one yeah. step back in season, but you're going to have to take a step back. That's, that's the, that, that's just the yeah, realistic. And then the subsequent steps forward become easier. Like I always see these kids that like come in the in season and they're, it's not always perfect, but when they come back, we start making gains again very quickly because they are still have uh, metabolically, they're still stressing themselves in the weight room over the course of the, the season. And it's important to realize the more metabolically demanding your sport is, probably the higher demand that there is for you to make sure you're lifting. And the irony of that is, is that the sports that are really highly metabolically demanding, basketball and soccer, uh, ones where there's really high heart rates and there's more running are the ones that generally don't want to lift, <laughs> right? Yeah. They don't want to lift in season. Whereas like football, you have one game a week, right? Yeah. And so you could probably reasonably plus football players generally like to lift. So like, Hey, if we lift on Monday and Tuesday or month, like you said, even your schedule four days a week and, uh, and especially the guys who aren't playing as much, they're probably gonna have a more intensive lift. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas like things like basketball and soccer, there's usually more games, uh, over the course of a week and it's more metabolically demanding, but you see like even and same with hockey, they'll lose 20 pounds yeah. over the course of a season. Like you'll see, I've seen guys start a season and look absolutely jacked. And when they come back in the off season from hockey or something, they'll be skinny as a rail. Um, because you think it's not just the sport, it's the travel, it's the stress, it's yeah. the nutrition. If you're on the road, if you're on a professional or a college level, it's not like you're eating your normal meals. It breaks them down. And so if we're not uh, thinking about building, you're taking it away. And anytime you're not intentionally building a quality, I heard on you know, Strength Coach this week, the one guy asked about, hey, one, a lot of my athletes are really strong at their core exercises. They can do wheel rollouts, they can do body saws. And he's like, so should I keep training at, or should I just go away from it? Cause they can do it. I go, well, if you stop training it, that you'll lose the quality. Like it's just the way it, training works. And if you don't pursue a quality, you'll lose the quality. Right. And so that doesn't mean you have to do a ton of volume or really try to push it, but you have to do things to maintain it. Keep the bucket full. You always use that bucket filler analogy, right? We don't have to keep pouring more into the bucket. We don't necessarily need a bigger bucket. Just keep the bucket at the level, right? Yeah. And try not to let too much spill out over the course of the year. That's really uh, what we try to think about. And so you talked about program design. And like you said, you only need 30 minutes. Like our in-season kids roll and stretch and warm up. Uh, we might throw some med balls. We really don't do any plyometrics or impact with them at all. We don't really run with them at all. Uh, they come in and they lift. Usually we pull out the Olympic lifting. Um, but they'll do some heavy open power. Maybe swings are usually a good option. Um, because there's less impact and then we'll get our heavy sets in and they're out the door. Um, yeah. like Mike, Mike has his, uh, Mark's lacrosse team in and uh, when they have games and stuff, they're still in during the week, but their lifts are like 30, 40 minutes long and then they're gone. Um, but they're, they're not getting weaker, uh, over the course right. of the season. And that's the big thing. And then I think you made a good point about from a business standpoint, talking to parents in marketing an in season program. And part of that has to be like, here is why it's important from an educational mm -hmm. standpoint. 
for them. You're not going to be sore. And like when you realize most hot NHL teams lift after the game, yeah. lots of MLB players lift after the game. Right. Um, and because it's the only time they can get it in and they're consolidating the stress, right? Because the high stress activity is that day. If you consolidate more high stress activities that day, you can recover another day and then probably get another lifted. And then you're playing next week again. And so there's always ways to do it. If you're creative, uh, you just can't be afraid of work. It always, no, people will do all the easy stuff during the end season. They'll get massage, right. they'll get acupuncture, they'll uh, do stretching. But the best thing you can do to recover is actually lifting if it's well placed because it's just going to make you tolerate the stress from the game better. So it's kind of proactive in uh, recovery protocol because you're keeping your tolerance very high. Right. And the, it, it, like you mentioned, the, it's very easy to do the passive stuff, the, the whirlpool, the massage stick the gun uh, and we're not saying you need marathon long hour and a half long workouts it could be as simple as so i'm going to use an example right now i have uh, a base two baseball players that i'm training very high level high school baseball players in their junior and senior year and their games are always tuesday and thursday so this is obviously much different than major league baseball where you're playing 162 games that's that's crazy to me, but these kids, they're playing every Tuesday, Thursday. So they're coming in Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. So mm -hmm. Tuesday, Thursday, they're going to be playing and I'm not going to do a ton of, we still do upper body. Like we did pushups today, but we've been doing pushups for the last six months before the season started. So it's not a new stressor to them. Uh, so today we did trap bar deadlift. So I, I did legs today, and I'm going to do front squat on Wednesday. But we've been front squatting and trap barring for the last, again, six months. And then Friday, because they're going to have Saturday, Sunday off, I'm going to bench press. So those are – and we're going to spend more time on upper body on Friday because I know they don't have games on Saturday, yeah. Sunday. If they have, they have practice on Saturdays, it's not – I mean, it might affect their practice a tiny little bit, but – not, I would much rather have them keep their strength and their conditioning than uh, try to baby their arm. I don't want to baby my athletes either. Like you said, it's no. all about being able to tolerate stress. And the other thing here then becomes injury prevention. The team with the best players playing come playoff time generally wins the football game. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, like the... Tampa Bay Buccaneers lose Chris Godwin, right? Two games before the playoffs. Like that was very, very detrimental to there. Now there was nothing you could have done from a training standpoint to stop Chris Godwin's injury. I'm just using it as an example here. If you lose your best player right before the playoffs start, that is going to be a problem. I and mean, if it was something that you, there's something you could have done from a training standpoint, if it's a non-contact injury or I always like to say that if instead of maybe tearing something, maybe they just sprain something, right? And so they're back in three weeks instead mm -hmm. of being out for the entire year. So those are my those are my big sale points or selling points for off season training. Is like you said, you're going to be able to tolerate stress better, which is going to allow you to perform at a higher level compared to the people who are not training, and it's going to reduce your risk of injury again there you can't stop all injuries if somebody falls on your knee or you you get a concussion there's probably not a lot of things you could train your way out of there um, but those are my big selling points or educational points that if we just continue on you've been doing it the last six months why wouldn't we continue to do it over the next three months at just a maybe a, a, a shorter duration but in keep the intensity like we still they both went up to a heavy set of three trap bar deadlift today and they have a game tomorrow yeah. uh, but they've and, been doing that for the last six months yeah and and that brings us to a good segue into programming considerations right and so i think there's some ideas about in-season training where people don't understand like you talked about going up to a heavy max i think like you, you can lift heavy in season. It's not intensity 
that wears people out. It's volume, volume, volume. typically. And so like typically the things they want to do is like higher weight, light reps. They think it's going to be better, but that's probably more of a grind on their nervous system than just doing one heavy set. We always say like, I just want one heavy set out of you today in bench, in trap bar, in whatever your main lift is. Just do a warm up. You could do two sets. You could do a warm up. You could do one heavy set. You could be done. Um, and that's going to be enough. The research even shows you that's all you really need to maintain strength and even build strength slightly over the course of a, a training period. So, and, and you're going to feel fine after that. You, no one really feels gassed after one heavy set. You feel gassed after doing like multiple sets of 10. Yeah. Um, and so, but, so I'll use the example of the deadlift we did today. We did the first set was 135 for 10. That was their warm up. We went mm -hmm. to 225 for five. 275 yeah. for four, 315 for three, 345 for two. That was it. That's all we did today yeah. for our heavy lifts. The rest of the workout was uh, shoulder arm care, you could call it. Um, some rows, some core stuff. And we did some slide board to end because it's very uh, low impact conditioning. And then see you later. That was it. That was our. And then Wednesday, we'll go to a, a heavy. Front squat, again, we'll work 135 probably for 10 and then work our way to 225 for two. Cut it right there. Not a ton of volume. Uh, it's their, their weights that they are comfortable with, that they've done before. And this goes back to the minimal effective dose idea. This is we You showed that graph in our last podcast mm -hmm. that if you just uh, do enough – you don't have to do anything crazy. You do enough. You can actually get 2% better over, a six, I believe it was a six-month time span. Whereas if you were to do nothing, you would get, I think it was 10 or 12% worse. You can correct me. Exactly. There. Yeah, it was, it was something along those lines. And and so it, it, like I, I was thinking, like, what are our main rules for programming? It's one heavy set. Yep. Um, we usually pull out impact, right? Yep. No, jumping, already no jumping, no of, running. No jumping, no running. Yeah, no conditioning. And they're already doing a bunch of sports specific. They're doing the most sports specific conditioning, like even to the point where you can condition them all off season and they're not in game shape until the first few weeks. Yep. So we don't really, we don't do any conditioning. And another thing I was telling them is don't stop doing the maintenance soft tissue work, like rolling and stretching that you normally did pre-workout. Cause like you, sometimes that's enough to keep the nagging things at bay that might cause them to not perform well or cause them to uh, miss a game, like consistently being like, okay, I'm going to do my ankle mobility work. I'm going to do my shoulder mobility work. I'm going to do my foam rolling. Generally is what keeps people feeling better because it's the cumulative input of those things over the course of the year that t tends to keep people uh, healthy. So I think if we, the number one thing we always talk about is like, don't let them skip the rolling and stretching. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure we pull out the impact work, get a heavy lift in, and then get them out the door. Yeah, uh, they don't well. have to be in here for a very long time. And just value the consistency over the intensity or the volume uh, over the course of and, the year. And, and that and, tends to really help us. And like you said, if you if you do it correctly, you can actually get stronger <laughs> as the season goes on. You, you can improve your lifts. And what will happen sometimes is because they are lifting less and they have more time to recover from the weight room, their weight room actually, their numbers actually improve. Yeah. Which is kind of you know, like counterintuitive, right? You're like, well, we're not doing as much volume. You're only in here twice a week for 30 minutes and you're going up. You're stronger than you were before the season started. This just doesn't make sense. And it's because, well, most of their stress is coming from the sport itself. Whereas now they're getting longer breaks in between their lifting sessions, which is allowing their weight room numbers to go up. So you'll be, you'll actually be pleasantly surprised with some people, not everybody, but some people will actually make gains mm -hmm. during their in season if they do less, but go heavier. So, and it kind of goes back to like, again, you said minimal effective dose or the feed the cats idea. When we talked about the Tony Holler and sprinting stuff is like, again, sometimes strength coaches think like, okay, well, if I just have people do more, they'll get better. Whereas like sometimes the irony of the end season is like, Hey, if I, I only go one heavy set and we lift twice a week, these kids get a lot stronger because you're just stressing them less mm -hmm. with less overall work. 
um, and they tend to actually get better. And then that's kind of why the, where the eye opener is. So like, okay, I probably could have done a little bit less rather than have them in here for a two hour program with a ton of accessory work that probably just lends to making them tired. Uh, as opposed to to making them stronger. And Mike had a whole thread going this whole week. Again, I feel like we always go back to something Mike says on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but talking about like why conditioning is typically overdone at practice by sport coaches and how like sprinting, doing some hard sprinting at the beginning is valuable, but all that extra conditioning at the end is usually a waste and usually a detriment, either an injury risk or either, or just fatiguing them not necessarily making the better. It's, it's the same idea there. Well, it, it comes down to a, an organized, well-led practice. So if anyone wants to know more about how an organized, well-led practice works, read uh, On Leadership by John Wooden. So John Wooden is was the basketball coach for the UCLA Bruins for 30 years, and he won 10 straight national championships, which has never been... Uh, matched by any other coach or sport, I think, ever. Uh, and he used to have his practices. He never went over. This, I, this is what I loved about him. He's He started on time, and all of his practices, I believe, were an hour and a half. They never They never practiced more than an hour and a half. He had every single minute scheduled, including the water breaks. And if you were not participating in some sort of drill, you were on the sidelines shooting free throws. So there was no standing around. There was no, you know, grabbing a drink of water on your own time or chatting up the equipment person. Everything had a purpose and everyone was doing something all the time. So everybody was doing a drill. And when an hour and a half was up, you were done. And you were, and everybody says if you if you've read anything by like Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Bill Walton, uh, all the his ex players, they all say they were drenched. They were absolutely smoked by the end of that half hour. They didn't need condition. They didn't need all this extra <laughs> stuff. They were apt because he stayed so on schedule and he had everything so lined up that you were nonstop for the hour and a half, but they appreciated that they weren't held there for three and a half, four hours where they're just BSing and like coaches trying to figure stuff out and they're like making up mm -hmm. plays. And like, if, if practice is led correctly, you don't need conditioning if it's done well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think sometimes like the, and this is, the, it's funny because the conversation Mike had was, it really started because there has been a series of uh, programs that different strength coaches, uh, I know Vinny was one of them that he had seen a program that a coach had given one of his athletes and it was a sport coach that said like, this is the conditioning at the end of practice today. And it was absurd. It was like uh, 400 yard shuttle, a hundred burpees, another 400 yard shuttle, then a hundred pushups and a hundred, 400 yard shuttle. And then a uh, hundred sit-ups. Like, it was just ridiculous. Right. Yeah. And um, really because it's one that sport coaches, um, don't have any training in performance enhancement or strength conditioning. And at the lower levels of high schools and universities, there isn't a performance coach. So they try to take it uh, into their own hands. Whereas, like you said, if they just led a really good sports specific practice, yeah. they'd probably get most of the conditioning, the things that they value, because they're not doing strength training. They're just looking to condition them and make them tired. They would get probably the results that they wanted without trying to intentionally bury them with shuttles and circuits and things like that. They could just run a really good practice. Right. I, I appreciate that they want to do strength and conditioning, even though it's not their wheelhouse. And I get it. The resources that a lot of these coaches have available to them are very, very poor resources. Like you said, that like mm. most, a lot, almost all of them, don't have access to proper strength and conditioning or the proper equipment needed. I can tell you right now, like, okay, maybe I'm the right strength coach for the program, but we don't have the proper equipment to run a proper program, but I do the best I can with what I have. I was going to uh, say you do. I went there. Yes. I saw it. Like you guys, you have a tiny weight room. Mm -hmm. You got a, <laughs> like a hundred guys <laughs> and you're running through kids. the best. <laughs> A hundred kids, three, the best three platforms, three platforms, uh, three racks, three benches, and dumbbells that none of the weights match. 
uh, but we make it work. I honestly work. think like, it would be a good experience for you to almost document how you run as a one man, and then sometimes you have like a high school kid assistant or whatever <laughs> helping you uh, run a strength and conditioning program because I was in there with you and like yeah. uh, how you organize to get the most out of very little, right? Because I think a lot right. of you, what you're doing is the norm. What we do at MBSC or what a lot of people in sports performance who have nice facilities like ours is definitely the exception to the rule and not the rule. Yes. And so yes. you documenting how you run it, especially in conjunction with practice, like they go yeah. out and do practice before or after, do their skill work, whatever, uh, would be a valuable case study uh, in, in how to get the most out of very little. And what I'll probably do, so like last year was my first year, and that was really a trial by fire. I was really kind of making stuff up on the fly and learning as I went. This year I'll have a much more specific uh, program, but also idea of how it's going to work. And what we're going to do this year, actually, is we're going to do skill positions or skill. So your running backs, your wide receivers, your your fast kids are going to be on the field first. And I have all the field work done, and we're going to do everything with lasers on the field. They're going to spend 30 minutes there, and then the linemen are going to be in the weight room with me. And we're going to do our big lifts like we just talked about. We're going to stretch. We're going to do our heavy stuff. And then we're going to switch. So we're going to do all our mm -hmm. sprint stuff before. Uh, we'll also do a dynamic warm-up, but together as a group. So a 15-minute dynamic warm-up will split into two groups, linemen and skills. And then we'll flip-flop. And that mm -hmm. way they're getting all their speed work in the beginning. They're getting their lifting stuff. And then they flop, flip-flop. And then Coach uh, Sims has his two hour practice. And I love what he said last year is he said, listen to, he said to all the coaches, cause some of the coaches were not happy that we were spending an entire hour before practice. So I got the kids out. from three 30 to four 30. We would work out in the weight room. And a lot of coaches were like, yo, we're wasting time. We're wasting practice. And coach said, you know, if you can't do what you need to do in two hours, four days a week, so that's eight hours a week. If you can't do what you need to do in eight hours, you're not a very good coach, straight up, um, yeah. which made me feel very good inside, selfishly, that <laughs> I got I got four hours a week. And so what we would do is Monday would be our trap bar days. Tuesday was our most intense practice days. So the, that was full pads hitting. So what we would do is we would just run hills and do a ton of core stuff. So mm -hmm. we would run hill sprints, core, and then they would go to practice. So that was actually my shortest day of the week. Uh, Wednesdays was front squat and bench press. And then Thursdays was, uh, I wanted high neurological stuff before we played on Friday, but I didn't mm -hmm. want heavy lifting. So we would do our hand cleans on Thursday with a ton of stretching and core stuff. And so our heavy lifting would be Mondays and Wednesdays. Our speed stuff would be Tuesdays and Thursdays in season. Um, but before mm -hmm. the season would be that kind of, like I said, we would break up weight room and speed stuff and then flip flop. So that's kind of how we did it. That's just an example for everybody to think of like, okay, what do we do before the season? And then what do we, what do we do in season? But it's a good example of how you can manage the stress throughout the week, right? You have two big days where you know you can get it in. And then like, again, and those, uh, those days work, are lighter you... days at practice. Yeah. So, and I know and that's that. a, you have a good relationship with the coach, which is what's the, probably the most important thing, right? And you have a yeah. guy who values what you do very clearly because, I mean, you have four hours a week at a high school level is rare, right? Very, you especially in season. Hours. Yeah. And, and so preseason, so, pre I get six hours a week, five days a week. Uh, during the season, I get four hours a week. So, yeah, it's a privilege because not a lot of high schools or a lot of kids or a lot of coaches have that option. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just, I want to, I want everyone to know on this call that I, we appreciate that sometimes the head coach or the sport coach needs to take the strength stuff into their own hands. Um, but it's, it's also on them to educate themselves to make sure that we're not doing stuff like 
three 300 yard shuttles with 150 burpees and 50 push ups, <laughs> and then a one mile run and a two mile bike ride, right? That's yeah. that after practice is completely detrimental to what your goals are. All you did was make them tired. You really didn't make them better. So, uh, I really, what, why we do this podcast, why we share what we share is because we just want to help people make better decisions. Like let's, let's raise the industry and make everybody better. So yeah. it's not to say yeah, that yeah. like that, that's a bad person or, uh, we don't like them. It's that we want to help them and, and education is the best way we can help people. Yeah, absolutely. And like, again, if it, like I've seen the best thing I see is at CFSC is when we have sport coaches yeah. and parents that come to that's my the favorite course. is when parents come and they're like i train my kids at home and i have trainers who train my kids and i just want to be able to help my kids more like that's like yeah and it's I, like, like almost I've had football touching. coaches and hard basketball felt, yeah. coaches come and say like listen i don't have the resources but i just want to make sure i know what i'm doing so i don't hurt people and i can actually yeah. make sure i'm getting them better and it's on the onus is on them and like it's really great when you see like we've had just recently i just sent uh a purchase order to a high school for a bunch of a bunch of sport coaches it wasn't they don't have yeah. coaches it was a high school uh and they sent a bunch of their sport coaches their football their basketball like we've done this at different uh places before and because they, they have to do it on their own but it, it is possible if you're a sport coach and you have the facilities and you can get 30 minutes in a couple times a week you're going to be heads and shoulders above the other teams you're probably playing because the chances are they're probably not doing that and um, a little investment on your education and a little investment of time each week uh, can can really pay off for the athlete's health, most importantly, and then also the team's performance. Yeah, and so a, a little bit more on the question that I got was, how do you almost market? It was really like a marketing or a sales question. Like, how do you sell to this parent or to this athlete that it's important and that you need this and that it's worth paying for in season. Cause what happens a lot is strength and conditioning falls to the bottom of the pyramid in the, or the bottom of the priority list. Once the season starts or once school starts and things get busy. Um, and so like what, he and he asked specifically, like, how do I create that relationship? So, but again, we talked about this. I don't remember what episode it was, but how do you create the relationship or communicate that it's important that you get here and that I can help you and that I'm not going to hurt your performance during the season? So, one of the best things I've ever done as a coach, and I just did this the other day, we I go and watch my athletes play the sport and I sit next to their parents. It's the most like, endearing thing. It shows that we care. I mean, we went and watched the playoff game of one of our basketball players and we sat next to her parents and they were so happy that we came. We waited till after the game to see her. She lost the game. It was a, it was a playoff game. So like, it was a very like sad moment actually. And, but we got to be there for that. Like we were there for her and she trains, she will train for us for a very, with us for a very long time and probably until her career is over and she's going to go play in college somewhere. So number one is creating that relationship. The first thing you can do is go watch the play in season. Mm -hmm. um, and so the baseball players I was talking about, as soon as they have a league game, because right now all their games are far away, as soon as they have a league game, I'm going to go watch them play. And I'm going to go hang out with them after the game. And, like, they're going to keep training with me because I keep making an appearance and I'm going to go sit with his pa their parents and hang out and watch the game. Um, it's the n number one thing you can do. And I know yep. uh, I've done this a bunch of times when I was at Boyles. A lot of our coaches mm -hmm. at Boyles go and do that. We all, we so, all do. We always tell them, like, listen, if you have kids in your group and you have kids you personal train, you should be going to their games. You don't have mm -hmm. to go to every game, but like no, I no, live in no. North, I live in North Reading. I train two brothers that are from North Reading. One plays baseball. It's college now. One plays basketball. And like it, when I get out of work at seven o'clock, it's easy enough to go over to the high school and watch 
And that's kind of nice, to be honest. I just sit there and watch a yeah, baseball yeah. game. <laughs> or a baseball yeah. game. Um, yeah. But you're right. The parents really are like, oh, my God, you're here. And the kids are like, oh, my God, you're here. You're showing me yeah. an investment in, right. in them. And like you said, it goes back to the idea of having a relationship. And then they're going to trust you implicitly to make the best decisions for them. They're not thinking that you're selling them on in-season training because it's an economically advantage thing, advantage for you, even though it might right. be. It, you're selling them on it because honestly, that's what you believe is in their best interest and you're going to make those decisions for them. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it goes a really long way. You'd re be really surprised. Like you said, that moment where even if she lost, that you yeah. were there, they see you as a supporter um, right. helping them. And so, yeah, take an interest in in their activities outside of just training them in the gym, and then they'll. It turns out they're really going to listen to you. So that's that's the easiest one to do, but also the most difficult one to do because honestly, you've worked all day. The yeah. last thing you want to do is go watch or drive to a sporting event at seven p.m. after working twelve hours. I get it, but yeah. it is it is worth it in the end. So if you want someone. And he used the word career when he said it. He said, how do you get somebody to train with you their entire career? That's how you get somebody to train with you for the, for their entire career. It's stuff like that, not just that specifically, but there's other things you can do. The other big one is just, I have the, now this is where things can get sticky is if you text with your athletes, you have to, remain very professional, but there is that option to communicate. And so I'm going to use my baseball kids examples. I have both their parents I text message with and both of them I text message with and I text message with all four of them together. So we're all on the same page. It's as simple as saying like, hey, how are you doing? How did the game go? How does your arm feel? Mm -hmm. That's it doesn't have to be anything more difficult than that. Again, we're showing our interest that we care and we're not selling them anything. Right. And like, maybe they say like, Oh man, I feel really stiff and I felt really weak last game. Like, Oh, this is like, that's like a softball for you to hit it out of the park. Like, Hey, why don't you come yeah. in and, and do a session and we'll get you back on the right track. We'll lift, uh, we'll do some, whatever, some deadlifts or something. We'll keep it light and just get you moving like it's it, it's and I, they might say like no i don't want to do that and that's fine but like if you want to create a career relationship if you want that person to train with you year round like this these are the extra we called it over delivering the over delivery checklist you go to their games you watch their games you send them text messages you ask them how they're doing you you follow their max preps. Max preps has all sporting mm -hmm. events and scores and stats. And so, hey, I saw you went one for three in the game the other day and you guys won nine to three. That's awesome. Like, how'd you play? Like, how does it feel? How's your arm? Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's not, it's, <laughs> it's not difficult, but it, it takes effort. Yeah. It takes effort. It's, it's, if you're only communicating with that athlete right before the off season, yeah, it or seems, in session, or seems, only at their yeah, session, it seems much less sincere, right? Whereas, like, if you are, and that's the irony. So, I think sometimes people think that, oh, if I'm going out of my way to communicate, it seems like I'm being salesy. But like, no, you're just showing yeah. a general, gen, genuine interest in that that individual. And so, right. if you're like, same thing, I'm always like, I, I watch uh the max preps highlights all the time i'm always i'm i'm in the town that a lot of my kids i train in are in i'm always reading the paper i'm always looking uh following the twitter feed for the school sports mm -hmm. reposting sending it to them same thing like that little investment shows that you care and then that is a huge business value proposition because then one they're going to keep coming but two they're definitely going to refer people and if they're successful like a lot of our kids are in my experience, then you end up seeing other kids because people look and say, oh, my God, that kid's like really strong or that kid is in shape all the time or uh, they're raving about their experience with you and they feel good. And then you're like, oh, OK, there's a few more clients that come through the door for you. Yeah, the uh, it, it's it's the extra effort, the over delivery. It's it's hard. It is hard to do. It is hard to do. It's simple. 
but not easy. It's simple, but not easy. You just got to make the extra effort to create that relationship. And if I had gone in and said, Hey, why haven't you been in the gym all week? Like, okay, yeah, that's, that's sales. Like that's me being a jerk. But if I just say, Hey, how you doing? Like, how are things feeling? And it leads to a conversation that gets you in here. I, I, we just had a, co- we just had a discussion. Like it was, yep. <laughs> I wasn't selling you at all. I was just asked you how you were. That's it. So that was, mm-hmm. I think our first podcast was just ask people how they're doing. It doesn't have to be, I don't need an HRV app to tell. I just say, Hey, how you doing? I just sleep last night. Oh, you ate, uh, you drank 10 beers and you got up, uh, twice during the middle of the night and you only slept four hours. Well, I, our workout's going to be a little different today. Uh, yeah. Oh, you you slept nine hours and you feel great and you haven't felt this great in years and you dropped 10 pounds. So we're going to get after it. Um, I didn't need a watch to tell me that. I didn't need a score. I didn't need a score to tell me that. Um, that's not to say those things aren't valuable. They are. They're valuable tools. But just ask people how they're doing. <laughs> Good wrap up there, Brendan. And we're right at almost an hour by the time yes. we do our book review here. So uh, once again, we went in with just a question and no plan. And here we are. <laughs> no um, question, no so, plan. And 51 minutes and 49 seconds. Yeah. And so by the time we kind of talk about what we have coming up and go through our books, we'll be about an hour. So um, I'll start with the book recommendation because I have this book right next to me. Um, yep. this, the, I'm a big Sean Aker fan. So if you are watching the YouTube, you can see this, but Brendan will put in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Um, Before Happiness, he also has Happiness Advantage. I actually like Before Happiness better. I think this is actually the sequel to Happiness Advantage. Um, He's a positive psychologist. So he talks all about positive psychology, finding meaning in things, and setting people up for success. And it's really meant for actionable, positive strategies for yourself, for success, both for life and career. But I've actually been rereading it, um, and I'm putting together this talk for the winter seminar this weekend. I'm putting in some final notes in my uh, kind of script about setting your clients up for success, especially in dealing with people who have chronic pain and back pain, and in rehab in general. It can be discouraging, right? They don't necessarily see a way out. They've been in pain for long periods of time, and sometimes how we communicate with the client doesn't match up with where they want to be or what their expectations are, right? Like we care about deadlifts. We care about bench press. We care about plyometrics. They care about playing basketball. They care about going hiking. They care about going to work with their kids. And so like one of the things I was talking about as it relates to training was he talks about finding meaning markers and setting up people's mental cartography to get to where they need to go. Because like often we talk about things we care about and it doesn't match up with what the client actually cares about. And if they're in pain and they're discouraged, it can be very hard for them to stick to a plan, adhere to a plan, and get to where they need to go. And this could apply to weight loss. This could apply to general exercise adherence, just like it could to rehab. And so um, this book is like stocked with like practical application um, in as far as how you plan things, write things out, and think about setting goals and executing goals. And so I found it to be a really good you wouldn't actually think it would be a book that would help you through back pain. But when I read it with that in my mind, I really thought about like how I talk to clients. And I think I've been successful with the people who kind of have chronic lingering pain because I kind of already had that, this mindset from like reading this book and reading similar types of uh, literature in like helping them figure out how to set themselves up for success. And so this is a a book I would definitely recommend uh, before happiness and happiness advantage both. I've heard you say, or you wrote an article once that was opportunity, not injury. Yeah. Right. So if we, if you're, you're only 5% injured, if, if your Mm -hmm. if your, if your wrist is injured, you're only 5% injured. There's 95% of you that we can still train and that we have an opportunity to improve. Um, my book recommendation is going to be, we're going to stay on the lines of back pain, is going to be Back Mechanic by Stuart McGill. So Stuart McGill wrote Low Back Disorders, and there, he has another book. They're both very scientific books, very anatomy-based type books. They're, they're written for the trainer. 
back mechanic is written for the general lay individual, a client that has back pain. And it's very, it's not that it's dumbed down. It's that he uses some incredible and, um, analogies and examples and ways to explain back pain and how to navigate back pain. And I found it to be much more beneficial for me, even as a trainer than reading his other two books. So his other two books were great. They explain the, the, maybe the, the why and gets mm -hmm. really, really deep into the nitty gritty details, but back mechanic tells you the how and how to get out of back pain and how to navigate back pain and what, what you can do about it. So back mechanic by Stuart McGill was one of my favorite reads, both as a trainer and as a consumer of someone who has back pain <laughs> myself. <laughs> I have a lot of back pain every year, at least once or twice a year, I throw out my back. So it was a very good read for myself included. Uh, so yeah, that, that would be my recommendation this week. Yeah, I find it Don't to be a good guy. Don't laugh at my back pain, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> I would never laugh at your pain. <laughs> never. <laughs> um, all right, nice, nice. Got another good episode so we, in the books. What do we got coming um, up? You, you didn't mention what we got coming up. You skipped well, that. So I have the uh, winter seminar coming up this okay. weekend. And with the winter seminar, um, I'm going to try to get at least one interview in. Maybe I'm going to squeeze in a second interview. So we'll have a couple bonus episodes, hopefully. Ooh. I'm going to try to do... Like with the main episode every week that comes out every Wednesday will be Brendan and I always, but when we have an opportunity, how lucky you are, <laughs> I know. Um, so, but when I have an opportunity with our Brendan as well, like traveling, um, or seeing other coaches, if we're able to sit down and do like an interview where we hang out with someone, especially if we can do it in person, I would always right. prefer, like, I like talking to you through the computer. Because you and I are really comfortable <laughs> with each other. It doesn't really change how we communicate. No. Um, but if there's people who we don't get to see as much and we can be with them in person, I'd like to try to start to do some kind of bonus interview episodes. And so I know I'll definitely on Thursday night this week, I'm going to do an interview with Drew Massey right here because he's staying at my house. So he doesn't have a choice. <laughs> he has to that's do an the, interview that's with the me fee. if he the wants to sleep here. Um, so we'll, I have the Miller lights are stocked up uh in anticipation of his arrival and so that'll get him ready for a little interview and then nicole rodriguez is in town um les spellman is here mark fitzgerald is here um, mike is here obviously and so if i can sit any of them down at some point in the next week as well while they're here and and do a talk with them i will as well but i know i'm gonna have drew on thursday so hopefully i'll get that out by sunday uh, probably not sunday because the winter summer on saturday it's Sunday. so i'll probably get out by monday Awesome. Um, next week and then um brendan and i'll find a time probably early next week to do another interview with one another so cool well, i uh yeah, i got what about you los altos or los altos this sunday upcoming sunday so near san jose california and after that i don't have a course until arizona i think my next course will be in arizona in april after that so i think i got the munch the the munch the month of March off where uh, Jenny, Rain, and I are just going to go do some, we're going to go ski in Tahoe. We're going to go to the getaway house that I told you about, which is, ba they're mm -hmm. basically shipping containers in the middle of the woods where you have no access to cell phones, which will be good for me. And then we're going to do, at, we actually booked an Airbnb on a river. So we're going to go canoeing and we're going to take the dog there and uh that's in place of unfortunately we had to cancel our our minnesota big sky trip oh, um so Montana. we're gonna go my, oh what did i say minnesota you said minnesota oh yeah that's no, the that's land it. of a thousand lakes that's incorrect sorry montana big sky montana montana we had to uh we had to move on from that event we're gonna try to do it again in october this year yeah so we're going to go for October. So that's, yeah, that's what we got going. Nice. All right. Well, uh, hey, you know, if any of you listening, this is going to come out on Wednesday. If you're going to be at the winter seminar, come say hello. Uh, maybe I'll do an interview with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lucky so, you. Uh, until or they, then, can sit on you. Your, they can sit in on your interview with Drew. Of course. Of course. 
Um, well, thank you all for listening and uh, talk to you next time. Thanks, Kevin. Take care, everybody.